Thank you very much for joining us. So I'd like to start with a quick round of introductions. Um, uh, Mark, how about you go first? Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and Toro. Hi, Mark Allis. I'm Chairman and CEO of Toro Biotherapeutics. It's a uh, private biotech that was founded largely on the back of Dennis Lehman's lab at UCLA. And so this idea of why are we here, it's because the science, the translational work, the history of uh, Herceptin, uh, and my relationship with Dennis that goes back 30 years created this. David Licata is uh, one of the founders as well, a Caltech entrepreneur. And so it's really a, a, a company that has all the hallmarks of great science, great people, and then the opportunity to scale from here. Uh, I've been in the industry for 37 years. Uh, most recently, which is now getting a little bit dated, uh, I was chairman and CEO of Celgene Corporation, that traded to BMS for $74 billion in 2019. So before we move forward, can you just tell us a bit about the, the, the modality you're, you're investigating or promoting and what, what are the you know, treatments or what, what diseases you treat? Sure, uh, so our focus is on solid tumor oncology. We do have interest in B cell malignancies as well, but right now it's mostly solid tumor oncology. Uh, we're developing a, ser a series of ADCs. We have uh, five molecules in the clinic against four distinct targets across a, a series of uh, solid tumor histologies. Great. So, so Marta, when we prepped for this meeting earlier today, you pointed out that you personally and your company is very different than the other members of, the, of, the, of this panel. So let's start with the personal introduction and what does your company pursue? Happy to, happy to uh, share with the group. So my name is Martha Lawrence, and I'm the CEO of Ascendo Wave. And I am a hospital executive by training. I spent my career at HCA for 18 years. HCA incubated a technology and I became the CEO. So we are a pain data company. So we've got nine objective databases on pain, oncology, MSK, uh, maternal health, important because a lot of our young moms are unfortunately dying. Um, we have one on seniors, um, so a variety of different objective databases on pain. And we correlate your brain waves with your perception of pain, and then we benchmark all of that data. And so we've got this benchmark data, and then we measure your pain against benchmark. Um, and I think the reason that you're seeing me on the panel, as opposed to maybe companies that are, are more similar, is that we are starting to partner um, in, around innovation. And if you want to get ARPA H money, you need to partner. And there are ways that technology can be used in tandem with our pharma companies and our biotech companies to reduce spend and improve outcomes. And I think this is just a, a, a visible way of seeing that convergence of our lanes. And 10 years ago, we were each in our own lanes, and now those lanes are converging and we're partnering and working together. Um, so we're focused on pain, sort of two focus areas, one is validating your pain so your pain is believed. Um, so pain has a bias problem. Um, you know, bias against women, bias against ethnicity, bias against seniors. And so it's important to validate your pain so you're believed. And then we're focused on objective pain data and pain databases, because pain is the number one reason why you access healthcare. The data shows up nowhere. It's not in claims data. You can't get it out of your electronic health record our number one driver of cost. And it's um, frankly a little shocking that for an industry, we have no real, no real data on one of our primary drivers of cost. And so those are the two focus areas that we have. So Sumant, you know, personally, I have two touches on goal with impact. The original technology came from Israel, uh, and I know the guys who invented it, and then you came to UCLA and licensed another technology from us. Yeah. So tell us about your journey. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Amir, for having me on this panel. And thanks to the TG uh, folks for arranging LA Best 2024. So my name is Sumanth Ramachandra. I'm the CEO of Impact Bio. Uh, I'm a physician scientist by training uh, and have been for 21 years in large companies, uh, mostly Merck, uh, Pfizer, and Baxter, or companies that were bought by Merck or Pfizer, and uh, ended up in a variety of roles in R&D, running a business, and then in 2021, I moved to the Los Angeles area with my family to join Impact Bio. I saw the promising technology that was licensed from UCLA TDG uh, based on the work of Dr. Yvonne Chen, Tony Rebus, and Chris Pukes House. Um, and these are all based on CAR T-cell technologies. Uh, usually uh, more than one binder is involved. Our lead asset is a CD19, CD20 binder. 
uh, to reduce the chance of antigen escape and also reduce uh, T cell exhaustion. Um, and then there is also a secondary uh, platform which has now generated its first um, uh, clinical candidate going through the going through um, uh, IND enablement studies in the solid tumor space. But we also, as an oncology company, pivoted from oncology into autoimmune when some spectacular data came out in Nature Medicine in 2022. Um, and so we actually operated in more than one therapeutic area, which has been quite a journey for us, actually, as a company and myself individually in helping build this from a research-based company now into treating patients and manufacturing our own products right here in Los Angeles. So it's quite a journey. And the Israel-based uh, technologies, you know, a company has to focus to be successful. We decided to divest it back to the university in Israel uh, so that we can use uh, the investor dollars in uh, the areas that we felt that would have the potential closest and nearest um, uh, therapeutic effect for patients. Jim, although not UCLA technology inside, you employ many UCLA graduates, and including a TDG graduate. So uh, take us through your story. So uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the CEO of A2 Biotherapeutics. Uh, I've been with A2 for seven weeks, so I'm well experienced at this point. And I can tell you everything you need to know about A2. Um, I've been in the business now for over 30 years. It's hard to believe. Um, I've had uh, opportunity to be involved in most therapeutic areas. Uh, although I had a chance early in my career to help build an oncology business at Astellas, which in 2009 didn't exist. And about a decade later, it's the driver of growth for the organization. So very proud of that. But also the exposure to oncology is why I was so interested in A2. We're focused on cell therapy for solid tumors. We have a very interesting platform, which we call TMOD. We believe it really is an innovative platform that will allow us to crack the code in terms of treating solid tumors with cell therapy. So we're proud of the work we've done to date. We have two programs in clinic right now, and uh, we're, like many of us on this panel, anxiously evaluating each patient that's being treated and evaluating it uh, through various dose levels and always waiting to turn over the next card to see what kind of outcome we'll have. But uh, again, appreciate being here and uh, looking forward to a Great discussion. So, Mark, uh, I heard you give uh, a great overview on why oncology and why now. Uh, it'd be great if you can give us the cliff notes or repeat uh, uh, repeat it for the, our audience here. Well, I mean, why oncology? If we start with patients, it's an epidemic, right? Cancer is uh, consuming huge amounts of the economy around the world. Um, we are extending life, and of course, with that extension of life, this is a disease of aging. So, the economic burden the socioeconomic burden of cancer can't be understated. So I think the need is as great as it's ever been, and it's just getting greater as uh, life expectancy uh, expands around the world. The other thing that is so incredible about the time is just sitting on the panel here, cell therapy, ADCs, all of that. We heard it from Chris Wiebacher and, and Bob Bradway this morning in their talks. There's never been a better time to be part of the journey to try to turn cancer from a death sentence into a chronic disease, a la diabetes. Uh, are we doing it? Yes. We can look at certain malignancies like multiple myeloma. 25 years ago, an, uh, a diagnosis of myeloma meant median survival of about three years. Today, it's easily 10, 12 years median survival on the back of all of the changes, including cell therapy. Uh, against CD19, but BCMA, et cetera, all these targets. So we've evolved to where the modalities, the ability to treat have gone way beyond the, the classic surgery, radiation, chemotherapy story, but even radiopharmaceuticals today are very, very hot. So I think when you think of immunology, uh, cell therapy, ADCs, all the biology behind what we understand about cancer and all cancers, not just the limited suite, um, it, it, this has never been better in the case of innovation uh, and extending life. So it's an epidemic, but we are creating new tools every day to, to fight that epidemic. Now, so once you have an oncology arm, but you're also looking into uh, um, other type of diseases. Can you tell us what, why did you decide to make that pivot and what, do, what you're pursuing right now? So uh, the greatest asset, other than the people a company has, is the ability to lever existing technologies into new areas. 
And I think that's really the philosophy. So what ends up happening in, in a company like ours and in several other companies, uh, emergence of data in the targeting of B cells in the autoimmune space became evident through this Nature Medicine paper I actually mentioned. And actually there was a case study in the New England Journal of Medicine from the same group a year prior to that, but people looked at it and said, this is really interesting, but when they saw five patients of data, so dramatic, uh, a lot of us, including Impact Bio, pivoted, say we have an asset that targets CD19 and CD20. What are the types of diseases where B cells are involved in the pathogenesis of the disease? So when you target and you ablate these B cells, you can actually abrogate the disease progression. And, and there are a number of diseases, and someone in the panel said this up here. The number and in a panel uh, where the R&D leaders are speaking, and I think there's, those are vast diseases. Um, I'll give you a personal example. Just last month, um, in one of the areas we're looking at, which is ANCA-associated vasculitis, you know, my aunt died, and she was diagnosed in November, and she died in April. Okay, severe. This rapid progression of the disease uh, took over her uh, immune system, destroyed her kidneys, um, and they gave everything to her. Um, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, the steroids, high-dose pulse-dose steroids, it didn't help. And yet you see these case reports now coming out where patients who have severe autoimmune diseases are getting B-cell ablation therapy, and suddenly the immune system resets. It, it sounds like it's a bit of a hammer. It is. Okay, you're literally destroying all those pathogenic B cells, and you are resetting the immune system, and you can maybe give long-term remission to patients that have these severe autoimmune diseases. So the ability to pivot and leverage your own technology was done. Now, we didn't have people in the non-oncology space, so we had to hire people in that space. But we have the same manufacturing people we leverage, the GNA is the same, the clinical team and the preclinical team, we have to get new people to help us go into this area. And just uh, two days ago, we uh, announced data that's going to be available next week um, in multiple sclerosis, and where we're showing that not only can we ablate the B cells, but we're showing that we can selectively ablate CD20 positive T cells, which are involved in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis and the severe forms of multiple sclerosis. So, um, so we are saying, okay, now we're going to be in more than one therapeutic area and two therapeutic areas and three therapeutic areas. How do we leverage this technology? So I, I think it's a frame shift, um, and we really want to help patients, but we have to also focus our resources in probably the right areas where we can make the biggest headway. So, so Jim, any uh, plans to pivot? Now you're seven weeks into the job. Uh, what are the strategic plans for A2? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, I think we're very focused on our programs right now. So we're very fo focused on, you know, continuing the progress on our two lead clinical uh, development programs. We're continuing to evaluate next opportunities up in our pipeline so we can move them into the clinic. Um, but right now we're very focused on oncology. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't continue to evaluate our platform to look at autoimmune or other therapies that we could produce from our platform. That's the benefit of a, having a platform. I also think the one key of being a biotech company is the ability to be more nimble, right? So that's one of the, I think, the characteristics of a smaller biotech is as you see this, you can actually pivot. Having worked at larger companies in my past, those pivots are very difficult to accomplish. So I applaud Impact and the team in terms of making that pivot, recognizing there's an opportunity and pursuing in really short order. So and finding a way to bring new cures to patients. But to answer your question, right now we're very focused on our clinical development programs and moving our pipeline forward in oncology. And what indications are you pursuing right now? So right now we're pursuing, we have two lead programs we call our CEA program and our mesothelin program. And those programs are right now basket trials. We've treated patients with ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and lung cancer. Um, so we're going to continue to evaluate the progress in those programs. The CEA program is further along. Uh, we just dosed two patients in our mesothelin program at this point. So we're, we're anxiously awaiting, as I said, more data um, from these patients as they continue to, to dose escalate. So what I would like to tap into your uh, background as a hospital executive. How will all these biotechs be measured for success uh, when they, it's time to treat patients? So we actually have a database on oncology and pain. And I think that um, we, will be doing, we'll, we will be doing much more measurement around um, drugs and um, how well they're working, um, how long they work, how well they work relative to other drugs. And actually, that's already occurring. 
um, both in um, in large systems as well as some some more moderate sized systems. Um, I was actually with um, Atul Boot yesterday, and he, they have 55 dashboards uh, for pharmacy that where they're watching the drugs. Um, and I came from a system where we did a project and we were, a new drug came out, it was 200 times the cost of a, a drug that it replaced. And we were using the technology to compare the new drug to the old drug and providing data to the physician so that they knew what the profile was between them. And they went to the cocktail and it was a $20 million swing. So I think you're gonna see much more of this in the future where our healthcare systems are measuring the drugs, um, and in some cases you're going to know about it, in other cases because they're going to come to you and they're going to you know, want to know comparative data, or they're going to be behind the scenes actually measuring those drugs and, um, and the spend, because it's a pretty big spend for healthcare systems. So I think you're going to see much more of that in the future. Okay, so I'd like to change gears now. Um, all of this requires a lot of funding. And, and Mata, I would like to continue with you because your road to funding uh, it's probably very different than the others here on stage, on the podium. So can you take us through that? Sure, happy to do that. So, um, so HCA incubated our technology. And for those of you who don't know who HCA is, um, I'll just mention that they own 184 hospitals. They do between 5 and 6% of all the U.S. inpatient care. So they're a fairly large operation. Um, and they... Um, pre-funded our first five deployments. So we didn't have to go to the outside market for money. Um, and I would tell you that that was not only helpful for us because it was we didn't have to spend the time doing it, but I want to just briefly talk about, because I didn't really understand this when I started, the difference between incremental innovation and transformational innovation. Um, and at least in our area, VCs tend to fund what I'll call incremental innovation. And it's primarily because of their time horizon. It's one year, three year, five year, seven year, you know, maybe sort of in that range. Transformational innovation, which is where we are, which really moves the needle in terms of cost and outcome, the metric for that is 17 years. And so it just doesn't fit the time horizon for a VC typically. Um, maybe somebody this afternoon will say, yep, sign me up for that 17 year journey, but that hasn't been my experience. And so it was really helpful to have a different mechanism to fund um, company growth. And, um, and I think that's why you see the government having stepped in with ARPA-H, right? So they're funding transformational innovation. It's become very clear to the government that much of those transformational innovations are not being funded through our typical VC funding route. They're really important to our country, and we need other vehicles to respond to that gap in the marketplace. So we have a different funding story, and um, and incredibly grateful to our, our hospital sponsors. So, gentlemen, when when we did you speak with startup companies these days, they often describe what's going on as as a nuclear nuclear winter of funding for biotech. But you were all did very well for your old companies, able to fundraise. Can you just? Take us through, through your journey to fundraising and how do you see the future with that? Uh, Jim, how about we start with you? I think it, for us, you know, we're very fortunate that we have very supportive investors that really funded the company from the very beginning. Um, so they're very committed. They believe in the science. So that's a key. They've got to believe in the science. They have to have a, a comfort with iterations of the science and a long-term horizon. While it's not 17 years, it's definitely not two years. You know, there's got to be a comfort of, we're going to be committed for a period of time. Um, it helps when you have investors like we do that have a long-term perspective. We have investors like the Column Group, Vita Ventures. They have built companies. They have understood what it takes to build companies. So the level of sophistication of your venture capital partners is critically important. I think for us, it's about continuing to recruit them on an ongoing basis, even though there are inside investors. We do that through constant engagement, but also through performance. So we're continuing to perform, we're continuing to move forward on our preclinical programs, our clinical programs, and we make sure that you know we're good stewards of the investment that we've been able to receive from them. Um, that becomes a virtuous cycle. So if you're performing, you're hitting your major milestones, you're moving forward with the science, like for us, getting in demand and being able to demonstrate the consistency as a company and the management team is leading on a consistent basis, then I think it becomes one of those things where you, your current investors will continue to bet on you. Clearly, though, to your point, this is not a great time 
to you know trying to go out and get an additional capital. It's better than it was in 2023, um, but certainly you know you're going to see the continued shakeout that we saw in 2023. But in order to avoid that, it's driving forward with progress, leading through this situation, and ensuring that you're re-recruiting your investors on a daily basis. So much. Yeah, so uh, we got funded by a very uh, good group of people in 2022. We had good Series A investors and Series B came in in, in 2022, and they are all very committed to the company. They're um, very good, well-known names, um, and they're same same way. They're very committed to the company. It'll come down to us demonstrating that the data meets their expectations, clinical data, um, especially when you have two potentially promising clinical therapeutic areas like e malignancies and uh, certain autoimmune diseases, there's a laser sharp focus. So we had a solid tumor um, platform uh, also in our, um, our pipeline. And um, uh, our board asked us, uh, can you get alternate funding, figure out a way to do this? And uh, we got non-dilutive financing um, and um, created a uh, bispecific binder. And we're going to go to solid tumors next year if all goes well. And basically, that non dilutive financing got us through the preclinical phase. We got to clinical nomination, and now we're going to IND enabling studies. And the person who gave us the non dilutive financing was very impressed. And he, impre he does in invest in companies and invests as an LP in some pretty large funds, has come in as an investor in the company as a part of the process. It, because every investor wants to see performance, period. Um, and then when we decided to go into the autoimmune space, we went to CIRM and we applied for a CIRM grant. And I'm very grateful to CIRM. I mean, they have a very competitive process. Uh, we got uh, ranked at the highest score, uh, and we got a CIRM grant um, for uh, helping on our lupus trials, all public information. Um, and so I think companies in this environment, and that, that was uh, given in February of, of this year, companies have to be somewhat creative, not just focused on areas that we can deliver, but if you truly believe in your pipeline and you know your financials just support a few programs. How do you then get the other gems in your in your pipeline to be funded? So these are two alternate mechanisms that we put into place along with the venture back capital. Both of them were non dilutive, and one of them, frankly, ended up with uh, uh, the person who gave us a non dilutive wants to come in on on our cap table as an investor. And I think that speaks volumes to the great scientists and the clinicians and manufacturing people we have in our company. It's hard to add you know, much to what you've already heard from my colleagues because Toral has taken a, a similar path, Series A, uh, a Series B, a year ago, April, that was really well-funded with world-class investors, and then a B2 that was really a company-led round, although we did have one of our investors step up to lead the round, and it was oversubscribed. It was a, a, a very healthy step up. And so what, what I would say is not to be cavalier, it has been difficult to raise money, but investors in every climate are looking for great science and great people. So how did I end up at Toro? Dennis Slayman, who's a friend of mine for 30 years, we worked on Herceptin together in the late 90s. Uh, he invited me to come to UCLA four years ago and see some of the data about the lead asset. We spent a day looking at it, and I was convinced then that Dennis's science, I didn't need to see that again, I knew what was happening, would break through uh, and had a high probability of breaking through where investors would see it. I certainly saw it as an industry oncology veteran. So that's roughly 2021. 2022, I become a board member, then executive chair. And through all of that, we were cultivating our investors. We were talking to people saying, Here's what we think is going to happen. Here is where we are in the clinic. And the story just got better and better. So that's where we go into April this year, so just a month ago or so, and raise the step up in a classic B2 round because the demand was so strong. So what's the secret sauce here? You predict success on the back of someone who discovered the HER2 amplification alteration 30 years ago which has transformed the treatment of breast cancer for that period of time. Myself, I've been in an oncology business for a very long time, have a lot of big products to my name, but I love what we're trying to do to make cancer a chronic disease. 
Everyone's touched by it. And so we decided that I would come, become chair and CEO at the start of this year. Why? Because you can talk to investors all you want, but you need the credibility of a skill set. So not only is the science investable, but the people who are leading the company need to also be credible and investable. So working with Dennis for now three decades and my great friend Dave Licata, who is a co-founder of the company, who was the CEO, we actually have a team approach to management where Dave is the CFO, I'm now chair and CEO. Dennis, of course, is a scientific founder. We created a management team even with just 30 people in the company and a connection to UCLA and TDG on all things related to science. That package is why people are stepping up and wanting to invest and to do it long term, as we've heard here. So past you know, success predicting the future, a lot of that is playing out right now, but I, I think it comes down to really two fundamental principles any day you're trying to raise money. Do you have great science? Do you have great people? And if you have those two things, you're gonna raise money. You're gonna be successful. So Mark, one of the biggest uh, expense drivers for biotech is typically manufacturing. And you know, we heard this morning, uh, the CEO of Biogen, Amgen, and Kite, uh, spending a lot of time speaking about their manufacturing capabilities. Now, I think the Toral has taken a different look into manufacturing. Uh, that perhaps comes with a regulatory risk uh, with the current, with the proposed Biosecurity Act. Can you uh, refer to that? Well, I can, and it's not just Toro. I think in the industry right now, the dependence on CDMOs like a Wuji, Aptec, uh, Biologics, et cetera, but others um, are, are in the news almost every day because of the Biosecure Act. Um, more recently, just so that we're all talking about the same thing, what we believed would happen seems to be happening with the markup of the current bill that's being debated in the House. And that is that there's this grandfathering effect, meaning that if there are changes where certain CDMOs would not be available to us, there's an eight-year window or a 10-year window, depending on who one speaks with. So our off-ramp in that context is taking advantage of the fact that we have more time. We have been partners with Wuji for a long time, we see them as best in class for uh, ADC manufacturing and other manufacturing as well. When we began, and this goes again back to Dave Licata, not me, uh, we did a bake off between all of the big names in the CDMO world for uh, complex biological manufacturing. Uh, and I know many of them from my days at Celgene. People talk about uh, Kite, et cetera, but Celgene uh, worked with Juno and then Bluebird Bio on two CAR T therapies that are now approved. One, a BECMA for BCMA directed CAR in myeloma, and uh, Branzi for CD19 uh, directed for lymphoma. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally familiar with the environment. So, we like where we are. We think that cooler heads are going to prevail around the world and in Congress about if we transition away from China and manufacturing there'll be a runway that allows for the healthcare system around the world, but especially the United States, not to be put into a supply constraint or some other artifact of a political intervention. So, you know, we like where we are. Uh, Wuji is our partner. And at least for now, we, we think we're in the right place. Uh, Sumant and Jim, can you comment about your manufacturing capabilities? So, so we uh, made a decision, I should say, uh, right before I joined, a decision was made to in-house manufacturing, actually in West Hills, Los Angeles. And um, it's actually, um, I think for us, the right decision. We have our chief technology officer, our head of manufacturing in the audience, and later on our head of manufacturing is going to be in the manufacturing panel that'll be coming up uh, later on this afternoon. And I, I think in cell therapy at least, there's a lot of process development and potential early changes in the product. And um, sending that to a CDMO, unless you're absolutely sure this is going to be the process, it's really difficult. Um, you can't make certain changes in time where we're able to make these changes. And literally, we're all on the same campus. Um, the manufacturing quality labs are right next to the process development and analytical labs, which are right next to the research labs. Um, we can go from our current process to an automation process. All those things are beneficial. Um, we're, we're dealing with a living therapy, 
And sometimes during that process, you find out that very small changes can change the attributes of a product and how it behaves. And, and this is the first time I've, I've worked with a living therapy. My whole life I worked with uh, more on the among clonal side as well as small molecules. And, and, I, and I went to this industry because I wanted to learn something I just haven't learned before. Um, and I wanted to grow intellectually. I wanted to grow and, and learn and take on new challenges. And it's definitely challenging. Uh, but the two things, so a venture capitalist told me once very early in my career, because I made a shift from big pharma to small biotech, said, just remember your job is two things. I, I took it a little bit insultingly, maybe I shouldn't have. He said, you only have to raise money and hire good people. That's all you have to do, okay? Um, easier said than done, right? So, but the reality is that we did end up raising money, but, the, and I interview every single person in the company because every single person is somehow touching that product. We just have to make sure they're not there for a paycheck. They're there for a purpose. They get a paycheck in the process, of course, but they know how critical the quality of the work that they do results in a direct impact our name of our company to a patient's life. And that is part of the interview process. And there are people who have turned down, who come to a final round, and I say, not the right fit. They may have all, everything right in the resume. They can, I think, do the job. But they're just not going to do the right thing when it comes to doing the right thing. And that makes me too nervous. So I do interview every single person. We're over 105 people now. So you get to 105, you probably have to interview 100. 50 to 160 people just to get to 105, but I think it's the right thing to do. In terms of manufacturing, you know, we view manufacturing in-house as a strategic advantage. And so we have in-house manufacturing. It ties to everything we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, everything from what we call base camp, which is our ability to identify patients early on and create almost a bullpen of patients that we'll have available to be able to enroll in our trial almost in real time. Um, without having the ability to have our control of our own manufacturing destiny, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we've been able to achieve in a very short period of time. So like I mentioned, we're currently enrolling two clinical development programs. Part of our success there is the ability to manufacture in-house and deliver to the clinical study sites and then also have the ability to tie into what we call, or again, as I mentioned, our key differentiators, base camp, and where we've already identified patients, we've been aphorized, we are working them up, and we're ready to dose them. Trying to do that through a CDMO is pretty difficult, and I think as it was just said, having the ability to iterate is also very, very important. So we have the ability to, to do that, we can control our destiny, we can move quickly, um, and we pride ourselves in being nimble enough to be able to do that. In order to do that, we have to have all of the important components of our company, we believe, under one how, uh, under one roof, and uh, we've been successful because of that. And we also just have an exceptionally talented team of our folks in technical operations and, and CMC. So, you know, what we view that also as part of our secret sauce. And so very fortunate to have a team that's in-house. We're doing a great job manufacturing for a clinical development program. Uh, and it allows us to be able to be nimble enough to pivot and iterate as necessary to meet the new clinical trial demands or needs. Just wanted to add to some of what you heard from my colleagues. It is modality specific, right? The cell therapy world. So cell gene, it was all in-house as well. We, we built it because of everything we're describing here. So I think if we're talking about certain biologics, using a CDMO makes sense, of course. But if you're talking about cell therapy where the process is the product, and you don't control it from end to end, you create all kinds of, of variables that could really cause problems. So I think when you're thinking about the company that you want to be part of, it, it really comes down to you know, thinking logically and, and, and looking for that risk of, of what manufacturing looks like, not today, but you know, six years from now. And, and cell therapy is so unique, everybody knows that. I'm actually hoping that somebody breaks through on the allogeneic side sooner rather than later so that we can find out how we can adapt manufacturing again uh, in the cell therapy space because we need more cell therapy. So Mother, your challenges as far as uh, making a product are different. Um, regulatory, you know, we have to think about privacy and HIPAA compliance. Um, so let's 
start with there with that and then if you can also speak are you uh, using coders in the US or you do uh, do you find that talent here or you have to go to offshore shops so we find the talent here um, it's a, actually our shop is down in San Diego so we have been able to identify the folks that we need on the, the talent side in terms of you know IT and technology um, and then one of the one of the ways that we get that data out to the marketplace is through a vehicle, a platform. We use DataVamp, but there there are several um, platforms where you can share data, and our data is um, de-identified. But you can share data in a HIPAA compliant way. So CMS uses LexisNexis. There's IQVIA, and then we actually use DataVamp, um, which is a pretty robust platform. You know, 120 health plans use it. 2,200 hospitals out of 5,800 hospitals. Um, a lot of life science companies use them. Even Apple and Google use it. So it's a way that you can transfer data in a HIPAA compliant um, way. And what it also allows you to do is um, sometimes the contracting piece of what we do takes a lot of time. And when both entities are contracted, for example, with the data band platform, you don't have to do a separate contract with each other. Um, and that was really sort of identified for me with one very large, one of the largest data companies in the United States who said, it's just so painful to do a contract with us. Thank heaven you're on this platform because we don't need to do that. And so it's really nice to have a vehicle to be able to transfer that data in a way that the marketplace feels comfortable with. And it's also more efficient than contracting with every different entity. Can you say also a few words about uh, the equity uh, uh, component of your platform? Because you, you started by saying that pain is not diagnosed or treated the same way through different patients group. Yeah, it's, um, it's a real health equity issue. So pain has a bias problem, and I, and I talked about that. The problem when you don't believe my pain is that I lose trust. I don't trust my doctor. I don't trust my healthcare system, and it's a it's a root cause health equity problem. Um, and so, what this technology allows us to do is to validate pain, so people feel that they're believed. And this is really we talked earlier about cancer, um, and I'd like to tell you a story about cancer because I just think it, we have actually a back to basics problem. <laughs> Um, and maybe the story will illustrate it for you. So um, I had a, a call with a physician. She's in charge of health equity for her health care system, large health care system. They have more than 50 hospitals. She said the number one complaint of their black patients, pain isn't believed. And it's showing up in a variety of ways in the health care system, and she gave me two. She said all of their black moms are getting less pain medicine than their white moms post C-section. And the other area is in cancer care. She said their black patients are being diagnosed with late stage cancers because pain isn't believed. And so we want our patients to get these wonderful <laughs> drugs and therapies that we're talking about today, but we have to believe their pain so that they actually are, are tested and are given these drugs and given these opportunities to really um, address their particular um, health situation. So that, that root cause health equity problem is significant. And I, and I mean no disrespect here, but pretty much the only people that aren't seeing this pain bias problem are white men under 65. The rest of us Women, ethnicity, seniors, and heaven forbid you're in all three of those categories. It's really kind of a triple whammy. Um, you have um, a challenge in terms of being believed in our system. So I would just say that as a sometimes a story can be helpful and memorable in terms of sort of crystallizing the situation. General, are you, are you taking this type of consideration when you design clinical trials to make sure that equity is preserved? Yeah, we're very proud of that. Um, at ASCO, Saturday of ASCO, you'll see that we're having a poster presentation um, in terms of how we as an organization have really changed the pre-screening criteria by using biomarker data to increase and improve diversity in our clinical trials. So we're very proud of that. And uh, having that poster accepted and then having a chance to present on Saturday 
it, you know, it's it's a proud moment for A2, but it also ties back to what we what I mentioned earlier, which is how we're looking to build off of base camp, where we've identified the patients appropriately, we've been able to a freeze these patients and get them ready to be dosed. Um, and we believe that this is one way that we can address health disparities that have occurred in clinical trials. And this has been a topic for as long as I've been in the industry. So we're very proud of the work we're doing to address that in this clinical trial programs that we're running right now. Yeah, uh, so it's a requirement um, in clinical trials. It's not just an effort. You have to be able to show that the population you have in the clinical trial is reflective of the population of the United States when you submit to the US FDA. Um, and if you have not put that effort in up front, you will end up with a problem in the study. Um, and because there is not just the health equity component, but in some communities, they're not seeking the care um, just because of lack of resources, mistrust, and other factors. And um, so you have to put the effort in right up front, uh, in whether it's cancer or autoimmunity. And we actually looked at a lot of data when we applied for the CERM grant um, where there is a whole section on DENI, and it actually you have to describe in the population you're studying uh, what proportion affect women versus men, minority populations, and you have to break that down for the state of California. And it was also very clear that beyond gender and race, socioeconomic status plays a huge role in autoimmunity because it's it, it's a chronic disease. But when you talk to the patients, it's a daily acute disease. If they don't have it under control, they're in pain every day. They have disfiguring um, uh, uh, lesions sometimes, um, and they have uh, a lot of uh, gait and limb problems. So they, they feel that that every single day, and yet they're not getting access to care that a more well-off person gets. So I, I think we we addressed it, I think, sufficiently in our, our grant application, but I think as part of any protocol implementation, you have to do it right up front. All I can add is that this issue is omnipresent. Everyone who does anything in healthcare understands to a degree or, or another uh, this, the disparities and, and clinical trial cruel is, as you've heard, top of mind all the time that we have the representative populations coming into the trials. I think of discrepancies across the board, but then we can go down into certain cancer types. Prostate cancer comes to mind where in enrolling patients who are at higher risk for the disease, African-American men, uh, for decades has been so difficult to do. And even trials that have been designed, quite frankly, with the idea that the homogeneity of that prostate cancer trial would only be for African-American men can't change the mindset yet of participating in clinical trials. The, the notion that a clinical trial in oncology is an experiment on society as opposed to trying to benefit society is such a fundamental belief system in certain subgroups of the population. And that's just the US, worldwide, there are other dish issues. So our responsibility sitting here is to make sure we do everything we can to have that representation mirror society as best we can. We can't change everything about how society thinks, but we could control what we do on, on, on our end. And, and we are doing that to the best of our ability. I want to add one thing. I was, when I was at Baxter before this job, um, I was not only head of R&D and uh, head of the pharmaceuticals business, but I was the head of the Diversity and Inclusion Council for the whole company. And a big part of that was um, the reason why they put me in that role is that they said, we need to make sure that our access, because I was also the chief medical officer, you have to make sure that, uh, the CEO said directly to me, make sure that patients are getting access to our commercialized products and to our experimental products that you're working on, and you have to be out there doing this. And it was a big part of the role, and, and I, I was very proud of that role, um, but I, I really um, have to say that the appreciation of the challenges, most people don't have, and I didn't have until I really had to step into that role. One um, last question, the same question to all of you. Where uh, LA Best 2025, what will be the big announcement uh, that would take place in your organizations in the next year? Uh, so I'm going to be really careful because I'm not sure I want to share the big announcements that might happen <laughs> by then. Uh, so a little bit of a loaded question. Um, 
let me just say this, the company is making huge progress. We talked about the support of investors, uh, the, the way uh, the assets we're developing are, are, are being uh, you know, developed in the clinic. We, we imagine that this time next year, we would have at least one pivotal phase two trial ongoing for our lead asset. We could have as many as two more phase two trials going on, a second one for our lead asset and a different histology, and then a third would be a completely different target and again, a different solid tumor cancer. Um, but but you know, I think financing could be part of where we are at this time next year, um, but we're scaling the company and Los Angeles is home base for where we're doing it. Hopefully our relationship with UCLA is as good next year as it is right now. <laughs> Marta. Um, so, you know, I think it could go two ways for us. We've already had private equity reach out to, to acquire us. Um, but I think more likely you'll see us with some fairly significant expanded uh, partnerships in the marketplace. Pain is a pretty big field, right? I mean, 100% of us will um, feel pain during our lifetimes, and there's so many different ways to go. So I think you're going to see an expanded partnership for us, um, and also, I think, through, through our work and conversations with the U.S. government. That was a 100% right statement that 100% of us will feel pain at some point in our lifetime. <laughs> Sometimes I feel pain just walking up on the stage. It is it's, it's as we get older, but that's correct. Um, so as a company, again, to be careful, we have two INDs open. We have um, two ongoing studies, multiple cohorts. Um, and I think we're going to have probably a third program in the clinic, completely different uh, asset in the clinic uh, in, by next year, assuming all, all goes well, ex-US and, and potentially in the US also. Will be spanning uh, multiple therapeutic areas. A lot of it will come down to funding. I mean, that's really the key thing. I'm holding my hopes that you know the Fed will see some reason in terms of cutting interest rates. The biotech industry is very interest rate sensitive um, because of the just inherent risk of the business. The IRRs have to be pretty high for the funds to want to come into companies, and then you have to have some differentiation, something that's different than the others out there. Uh, and I think that is going to be a key part of our own story is to build that differentiation through our clinical data and through our assets that it, it we become attractive for whatever it's private, public, whatever round of funding we go through. Uh, 2025, I hope to be invited back. So put that on your note now. Um, from a company perspective, I would say we'd like to see some results from our ongoing clinical development programs. And, and those are auto programs right now. But to Mark's point earlier, we are advancing an ALO program, uh, EGFR program, in partnership with Merck. So continue that uh, program. Expect to file an IND in September-ish. Uh, so continue ad to advance the current state of our programs. Move forward on another one or maybe two um, preclinical candidates that would move into the clinic in very short order and maybe in 2025. And even perhaps be in phase two um, in 2025 with one of our other clinical development programs. So and the punchline is continue to, you know, meet our milestones, continue to grow as an organization, um, and continue to make sure that we're delivering on our promise, which is we want to find a way to cure cancer. Great. Uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, please join us the other half of this room to see the scientific poster session. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.